My name is Shamila Chaudhry. I'm a senior South Asia fellow here at New America's International Security Program. Um, on behalf of New America, thank you for joining us today. Um, today's conversation will focus on empowerment through education in Pakistan. And when I heard we were having this event, I was really excited because this is a topic that is typically underserved um, in the Washington discourse on Pakistan. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Fiza Shah's views on kind of the nuances associated with working in a country like Pakistan. Um, and I think it's all the more important that we're having this conversation today given the tragic attack um, that happened in a school in Peshawar. Um, over 130 people were killed, several of them, most of them were children. Um, so I hope that we can talk a little bit about uh, doing work on education in this kind of security environment, but I hope that um, it doesn't overwhelm the conversation um, because I think that there's a lot of uh, nuance associated with working on education in Pakistan and there's been, um, you know, there's a lot of committed and dedicated people who have been working on the topic for decades. And we're very fortunate to have Fiza Shah with us who has been covering um, education uh, for girls and women um, throughout her career. She is the founder and CEO of Development in Literacy, uh, DIL, uh, which is a nonprofit organization it focuses on underprivileged uh, youth, especially girls. Um, it also focuses on providing uh, professional development and training for teachers and principals in Pakistan. Uh, and she has been educated in Pakistan, the United States, and also in England. And she's continuing her education um, at UC Irvine. Uh, she's pursuing uh, an executive MBA there. Um, also joining us via Skype, uh, I hope this is going to work today, is Ms. Shireen Sale. Uh, she's a project manager with Dil Noah, uh, where she manages 21 uh, schools in the Kharpur district in southern uh, Pakistan in the Sindh province. Um, we're very happy to have her. She's also a college lecturer um, with the Pakistan Government Education Department. Um, and prior to joining Dil, she did some work on uh, family planning and reproductive rights um, health issues at Marie Stope Society. Um, so both of you welcome. And I'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it casual. It's a small group and there's no need to be uh, formal about it. I'll turn it over to Fiza and um, I'll, we can go from there. Thank you, Shamala. And yes, please uh, do ask any questions even while the earlier part of the section because I do want to answer um, or you know, at least know what you're interested in hearing. Um, Waking up this morning to the devastating news uh, about this attack by the Taliban on um, army military school was really heartbreaking. Um, it really hit close because my father was in the army, he was an engineer in the army, and we went to very similar schools when we were in Pakistan. Um, I think this is really hitting, hitting it where it really hurts, and especially touching the young innocent children. Um, I, I th I'm, I'm hoping that there's going to be strong retaliation against this. Uh, but, you know, I, I also want to tell you that even Dil was, has not been spared the wrath of, of the Taliban. Um, in 2006, one of our schools was attacked by, by the Taliban. Fortunately, it happened in the middle of the night. So when they did burn the school, n nobody was injured. But can you imagine the next morning? This was a girls' school. So the next morning when the girls came to school, it was... I, I remember the teachers relating the, the, what happened and how sad they were and how they, they cried to see their school burn down and to be told that, that, uh, that having an education, a modern education, was, was, you know, was something that was un-Islamic um, um, and, you know, and immoral. Um, and I, I also take off my hat to the teacher who used to actually come from a nearby village. Uh, when we tried to open a new school in that area, um, the parents actually refused because they were too scared. I mean, this, is, this had just happened. So, so this brave young woman uh, ended up opening a school in her own village, and these girls uh, continue to get an education without an interruption. So, you know, there, there are those brave ones, too, that continue to fight against the struggle. And, and I think in, uh, in, in terms of my own organization, I think it only strengthens our resolve to continue to do what we do and to continue and extend our network beyond the, school, the areas that we are working right now. Um, before I start telling you about my organization, I also wanted to kind of set the stage as to um, 
the kind of the context in which we work. Um, I, this organization started in 1997. Uh, currently, we have about 122 schools all over Pakistan. Um, and we are educating approximately tw uh, 22,000 students. Um, but the context that we work in is, is what, what really makes the work so meaningful. Um, I, I'm not, um, that I don't know if you guys, are, if you, all of you have the background in terms of the adult, the, the, the situation in, the, in Pakistan in terms of literacy. Pakistan's uh, literacy rate is 55% only. This is the adult literacy rate. Um, the, there are almost 25 million children in Pakistan right now that are not attending school. Um, majority of these kids are going to government schools and the dilapidated condition of almost 48% of the government schools makes uh, education very difficult um, and very uh, not meaningful for these students either. Um, they don't have toilets, they don't have uh, um, boundary walls, they, they don't have uh, drinking water, some of them don't have furniture and some don't even have classrooms. So you can just imagine the quality of learning that's happening in these schools. The teachers at any given day, uh, between 20 to 18 percent of teachers do not come to school. The curriculum itself, um, the, uh, at least the curriculum textbooks, are very outdated. Um, and majority of the learning is by rote. So in a sense, kids are going through school without learning much at all. A recent study that was done by um, Asser shows that fifth grade students, um, English learning is at second grade level. The fifth grade students are not able to do double di digit division either. Um, even in their own local uh, native languages, they are not able to read a storybook. Um, so, you know, unless these issues are not addressed, uh, the, the country is never going to be able to break through these issues and problems that, and, and, and that it's having currently. Let me tell you about what happens in DIL schools. Um, DIL schools are providing a modern education. We have, um, we really work on developing our students' um, soft skills, their, their critical thinking, problem solving, um, their um, reasoning, we encourage them to ask questions, we, we try to build their confidence. Um, and, we, and we are seeing the results of this, uh, not only in, in the way these, these kids themselves are conducting their lives, but there's also a change happening within the communities. Um, and that is something that I really want to talk to Shirin about, because Shirin has been involved with our Kherpur schools for over 10 years now. And during this time, she has been able to see the, the kind of change that has happened. Um, and I, I, I'm going to invite Shirin right now to maybe, um, Shirin, can you, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, Shirin, um, would you, um, I would love to hear from you the change that you are seeing in, in your students from the time that you started with Dil and, and now. Uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon to all of you. I can't see even <laughs> any of them, but uh, um, and it is good that uh, you gave me a chance to talk here in such forum, such forum. Uh, as far as your con question is concerned, Fiza, that what type of change has uh, uh, done here means if I compare um, the current situation with the past 10 years so um, if i see um, the uh, years the 10 years ago the situation was like that the community was not agreed to open the schools in their area in their vicinity they were refusing us to open the schools for the girls uh, secondly they were uh, not agree if once they agree to open their schools, uh, most of the uh, community people's people were do not agree to send their girls to admit their girls to uh, to our schools. Thirdly, there was uh, um, perceptions and social taboos in their mind, like their mindset was uh, that the girls who get education they would escape from their homes, they would marry of their own choice. 
and uh, secondly uh, they were uh, they were not thinking good to the earning girls because they thought that this is a shameful profession and awful something um, like that so these all were uh, their mindset but if i see now after passing 10 to 10 years in the same field so there is a vast change in such uh, perceptions and social taboos we have overcome on these all things um due to only education uh slowly gradually when we first opened the schools we get succeeded to open the schools though they were uh, first not only from the side of the uh, father parents but the from the mother side from the female side was there was a resistance to open the school even but slowly and gradually and uh, um uh, so uh, we uh, talk with them motivated the community open open the schools there and first we had very uh, very low number of enrollment in high schools so that was uh, 25 50 students just like that and um, uh, and they were not even regular so people were also used to use them in the in the fields uh, they were taking house chores from these girls uh, slowly after educating the girls and with along with the girls we also educated the parents through different meeting, meetings through different advocacy sessions with the fathers first we involved fathers and uh, slowly we involved mothers too so in this way uh, we succeeded uh, to get the girls in the schools we we increased our enrollment in our schools now it is 200 uh, more than 200 in each school so and uh, they change their perception like uh, um uh, first they were very um, they were uh, marrying their girls in early age like in kg class in class 1 or 2 or 3 so they were um, on that time the students age was uh, from 6 year to 8 years 12 year so uh, now it has changed they are getting marriage after at least after completing elementary class means 8th grade so um this uh, i could say that this is a big change among community yes definitely thank you shirin thank you you know um when i look back to the time when we first started our intervention in 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 um, the rural areas of pakistan there were incidences where fathers would burn their daughters books there were um, cases where girls would go to school when their fathers were not at home so many of the fathers would work outside of the home so in the morning when they'd leave these girls would at the same time get dressed and go to school and they would make sure they were back in time they would hide their books um in a few instances when the fathers did find out they actually ended up beating up the mother for allowing them to you know to go to school but they they were so strong in their resolve to continue their education that um you know nothing nothing could stop them and despite being beaten up and despite everything else the majority of the girls continued um and somehow the other ended up then convincing their dads and you know i I'm, i'm just so happy to see that those kind of incidences are not happening anymore instead it is the other way around now instead we are all getting demand for more schools um you know from yes. neighboring villages especially and shirin i'm sure you can corroborate that as well because they are the ones who keep putting you know the, the people who are in the field like shirin keep bringing these demands to us and you know we can fulfill some but we can't fulfill all especially in villages where there's no educated woman it's really really difficult for us to find um you know women who are educated because majority of our teachers right now are, are the first women in their women in their families to get an education um and shirin maybe i'll ask you to say a little bit about that as well but um uh, but you know it with time it it is so it, i'm seeing almost like a transformational change happening in these communities just like shirin said there were so many incidences of girls getting married at the age of 11 and 12 mm-hmm. even now we hear of that once in a while but the mud, the parents now now that they've understood the value of education they are really uh, kind of you know withstanding the pressure from the communities to get the girls married off early but they say no we have to get our girls uh, through primary then it's the to secondary then is you know let them at least have 10 years of education the other thing we are seeing is 
that our teachers are having very few children. I mean, in, in the remote areas of Pakistan, I can show you every person that I ask tells me that they have 10 siblings or nine siblings. And teachers are, um, it's something that um, Shirin was telling me yesterday as well. She said most of our teachers, and she's kind of done a study, no more than three, to three maximum four kids. So that in itself yes, is such a beauty. Even uh, when I, yes, sometime when I ask teachers, why do we are uh, confined to two or three? They say no, in, in now situation has changed. So we will not uh, produce more children because these are enough. We, we have to give them more good quality education. So the teacher's perception, perception has also changed because they are now limiting their families to two to three. Uh, if I see uh, past years and it was uh, six, five, six, seven, like this. So really it has changed a lot. And the teachers are the role models. You know, they are the ones who yes. really set, set the, the path for the younger, the ones that follow. I want to tell you a very interesting story um, about one of our um, star teachers, trainers, who's uh, Farzana Seal. Um, she, wow. her school was in a very, very remote area of, um, of Sindh, and that school also comes under Shirin's cluster. We were having a really tough time keeping enrollment of girls high enough to justify keeping that school open because we, you know, there are costs involved in running a school. And if there's not enough enrollment, we start telling the, you know, the staff to maybe think about closing the school down because we can always open it somewhere else where there'd be more demand. Um, <laughs> the teacher got really concerned because she felt that, you know, there was so much need here that, that if they closed the school down, it would really be very detrimental to the girls. So what she did was she called uh, the mothers over um, for a meeting, and she asked them to sign their name as they were leaving. Believe it or not, not a single woman could sign her name because none of the mothers were educated. So as they were leaving, she said, you know, how do you feel when you have to, what do you do when you have to sign your name, maybe on a government document or you know, something of, of, of that kind? And they said, well, we use our thumbprints. And she said, how does that make you feel? I mean, don't, don't you feel bad about that? And they said, yes. Yeah. So she said, you know what? I'm going to teach you how to sign your name. And you can bring your friends with you. And she said, next day, all the women showed up, all of the mothers, with their friends. And she said to them, look, um, nothing in this world comes for free. If you want me to teach you how to write your name, you need to make sure that all your daughters are in school and they come regularly. Yeah. And that was, she, she told me immediately after that, they had a class full of kids. You know, because the, the, it, it just made the parents realize that they have to participate in this. There, there is something to this education that they need to, uh, to understand. And this is how she started pulling them in. And then from one thing to another. And um, now Farzana has a school which has, we actually just built the upper section. It's, it's going to become a secondary school soon enough. And something else that I, uh, while I'm telling you Farzana's story, something really interesting happened. Um, in the last couple of years. Now, over a period of time, some, there were some kids that graduated from this school. And um, because this is such a remote area, there are not very many opportunities for girls to work. Most of them come back to teach. And in, we've got a number of students in our schools that, that graduated from our schools and have come back as teachers. So you know, that in itself has given them a certain position in society uh, that is really changing the perception of women and really redefining the roles of women in society as well. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But coming back to Farzana's case, um, so we, um, she actually met with her, some of her student graduates and said, you know, we've, we've taught you how to, how to think critically. We've given you reasoning skills. We've you know, given you everything. We've given you entrepreneurial skills. You need to come up with something. You cannot wait for someone to give you a job. I mean, there are only so many teachers that, that can you know, come back and teach in the school. And so, so you know, they went out and they, they met. Actually, the, the, the parents met with the, uh, I'm sorry, the teachers met with the parents as well to discuss this with them because you, you can't just talk to the girls. I mean, this is, this is an area which is very conservative and you do need the OK from the parents before you can you know, venture to do something. Um, the girls came back with a very novel idea of starting a women's store. Because remember, in the backward areas of Pakistan, it is the men who, are, who sit behind the counter. They are the ones who own the stores. Mm -hmm. And so even when women go to shop, 
uh, I'm sorry, women cannot go to shop because if they go to shop, they, they will have to either go with the husband or the husband goes and shops for them. So, so when this store opened, um, it's been almost two years now and it, it's done extremely well. Um, they, they've opened, uh, Dill students have opened actually two more stores after that. But what was most remarkable was that that particular year, when it was time for enrollment, new enrollment into KG, generally we would barely hit 20 kids. We had 25, sorry, 50 girls uh, enroll, and we could only take 20, uh, 25 out of that, because in a classroom we, we cannot take more than 25. But you know, what I realized was that parents finally saw the value of education. You know, all this time they, yes, if they get, if they got their daughters educated, what would be the end result? You know, what was what was the means to this end? You know, what was the, yeah, where were they heading? And um, this finally made them realize that yes, yes, there is there is a chance for their girls to. Uh, you know, to, to make something out of their lives. And, and uh, Shireen, you know the story well enough. I mean, uh, how are the stores doing and, and what is the impact that you are seeing? Um, they are going very good. And uh, looking to those shops, some other uh, graduates came to, uh, to open the same type of the shops and they have opened. Uh, so um, looking to these girls, others are uh, getting um, interested and they want to open more shops. Not only they are confined to shops, but they are doing also some other work, like they are doing some handicrafts uh, by uh, through uh, searching from the net. They are um, looking the color combinations, and now their uh, work ha we have introduced their work in the markets and to the other handicraft shops. So it has also uh, they have also developed the such type of source income generation source so likewise some some are doing good embroidery they had idea but they didn't had idea how to market their work so through net again in a schools they come to a schools they use the net and they they um, find some new trends and um, and the modern trends in such embroidery and they are doing uh, that embroidery and we are again sending these uh, to the Karachi market. So um, our uh, students, I, I would say that um, they are really uh, performing good uh, and looking to each other and looking the uh, impact of uh, um, and their families too. When they are looking that these girls are the, now the source of income generating and they are supporting their families, their siblings. So uh, this ha has also um, uh, increase their interest towards the schools. That's why more enrollment is coming to our schools and parents are just to enroll more students. That's why, as you told, that we have um, initiated evening shift classes for those students to accommodate more students in the same uh, premises, in the same building. So, yes. Thank you. Um, Fiza and Shireen, you both uh, have mentioned a few times the positive impact your work has had on the women in the families and bringing them more into the process. Um, the few times that you've mentioned the men, they've been uh, negative. Um, and you've, you've talked about parents getting more involved and in being socialized. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more specifically about how your organization engages fathers and brothers um, of these young girls that are in your schools and how they have changed kind of in their approach towards um, educating their daughters and sisters. Shireen, do you want to say something about that? Uh, actually, I would say in a one case, I remember now uh, related to this, that uh, uh, we, we opened one school in a, in a village where there was a government building. So we opened schools there um, and we had good enrollment in that schools. Uh, uh, there was a government teacher also appointed in that school. But she was not used to come in the school. But uh, after looking at our students, our teachers, she uh, she used to come, but not on a regular basis. Then she had a fear that uh, maybe government staff charge her that she is not going to school and another NGO is running the school. So she started uh, teasing our students, our teachers, and she created a lot of troubles so that we should leave that premises. And a result, when we saw this, 
we uh, talk with the community that uh, that the teacher is not ready uh, that we continue uh, uh, giving education here in this school so what would you say so they told the, no they are the the teacher is from the feudal um, vadiras uh, daughter so we can't do anything against her so we simply said that okay we will close the school then if you are not agree for this then um, uh, one student she was a our student when she heard this she went on hunger strike she told that uh, i wouldn't take anything until you don't accommodate this this school in our area so his father was very worried about that uh, he came to us he told that okay i am donating you a plot you construct a uh, school building there because my daughter is on hunger strike and she she even she is not ready to talk with us and she has only one demand that uh, do something for this school to sustain this school so um, i i feel proud that we constructed building there in now school is running very good and it is very successful and all the students are happy and the government premises is premises is um, vacant now no no one no one is student is ready to go there but they come to us so um this yes yeah, so this is the main i i think main, um, yeah sorry you you are giving us an example of how some of the males have also been very supportive i think overall we have seen a huge shift there as well mm -hmm. there there were times as i said when you know men were very much against and uh, uh, their daughters getting married and mm -hmm. especially brothers for some reason mm -hmm. would really stand up and mm -hmm. i think the fear always was that if you educate a girl you know she is going to as she was saying she's going to um you know start speaking up and wanting her rights and you know and this is one way to keep you know to curb that but uh more recently i'm seeing a lot of fathers bringing their girls to school um we did a recent um intervention where we had uh, the our students teach their uneducated mothers and aunts and in some cases the fathers got who who you generally see the fathers are more educated in the, in the villages as compared to the women and the father stepped in to support their wives in you know when the kids were kind of um, did something wrong or said something wrong the fathers would step in and that not only helped kind of you know develop a better relationship amongst the family mm -hmm. because with the kids and parents all involved it really um i think made the fathers realize how important it is for their girls mm -hmm. to have an education mm -hmm. and they're already seeing the difference in their homes you know they they tell us the girls tell us that we um th that you know we are, we are seeing that as th th at least the the families are seeing that educated girls are act, they, they don't they don't argue they actually negotiate you know with 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 parents and very often um these girls if they if they are married off into into other um you know into other families they even there they are trying to renegotiate re with their in-laws to allow them to continue their education we are seeing a number of those cases as well mm -hmm. so you know i it, it feels like once th this this it's like a movement that has started there mm -hmm. and there is nothing that's going to stop it it's it's a tide that's you know that that started now sure. and um yeah, and i for me it's a very very positive thing to see um and i see this as the only solution to all the ills that we are you know every day that we come across in pakistan um especially these 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 awful you know terrorist acts and uh, in my mind the only solution is education uh, it's and but but not just any education what we need to provide is a quality education where we are actually imparting the right skills to the to the children so that they have a voice and they they can do something with their lives um i wanted to touch a little bit about on our on our teacher training program which is really the strength of del we have a training college that provides uh, that has been providing training to our uh, del teachers <coughs> for over it started in 2006 so it's you know it's been quite a number of years now and but more recently we've been start uh, imparting uh, training to um non del schools and government we're going to this year we're looking at uh, providing training to government schools as well um the 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 i think the strength of our train uh, teacher training program is that it is really catering to the rural uh, teachers that that do not have access to long term 
um, education uh, training programs. So we continue to give them training uh, over the year. So we, you know, during the summer, there's a there's a, a lot of focus on um, on you know getting the teachers to work on their uh, uh, subject content knowledge because in the rural areas, the teacher is first. It's not it's not that you have to teach her pedagogy. The, the training centers have to do much more than that. You have to mm -hmm. literally teach them the subject content. Um, and the, you know, the, the concepts um, um, so, so that they can teach you know, meaningfully. Um, and again, I would ask Shirin in a little while to explain what the training does for the teachers. But over the years, it has empowered the teachers so, so much that it is the confidence with which they teach now. Um, you, know, you, you, can, you can see how that is changing the, the way the students are performing. Um, they, uh, most recently, we, uh, we got a grant from USAID, and we um, have done an M-learning project, which is, uh, which is based on uh, using smartphones to train, uh, to help teachers understand concepts. So, so what we did was we initially we did an assessment on our teachers, and we found the gaps in English and math. And this is for the third and the fourth grade um, um, school teachers. We then uploaded these videos onto their cell phones. And so they, remember in the backward areas, they have no, um, they really have no resources available to them beyond, um, you know, beyond what they, they've been taught in their own schools. And usually, because this is the first generation of teachers um, in, in those backward areas, their own uh, understanding of subjects is very, very poor. So, uh, the, this project has done extremely well. They've, it has improved their concept clarity in math by 40% and their concept clarity in English by 30%. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we are now hoping to take this program to scale because it's one of the few uh, mobile learning programs that has done, uh, done well throughout the world. Um, we are hoping to take it to, the, to government schools this year and then even maybe beyond the borders of Pakistan mm -hmm. because English is as a subject, you know, we, we, it is taught in English. So it should not be, be an issue, but in areas that have very similar mm. kind of setup as Pakistan, such as maybe Afghanistan and even India, you know, that those are areas that we're also contemplating taking the program. Um, Fiza, you mentioned the teacher training will focus on some government schools. Could you talk a little bit about your organization's relationship with the government and working in the sector? You know, we have actually not had too much interaction with the government okay. so far. But we understand that majority of the students are going to government schools. Mm -hmm. and, we, um, and as our work is getting uh, to be recognized in Pakistan, mm -hmm. we are being approached by, so far it has been non-governmental organizations. Mm -hmm. But we have been talking now to the KPK government. Mm -hmm. um, and they are quite interested in us taking over certain schools. So we are right now we are in the process of negotiating with them. Mm -hmm. But that is definitely an area we'd like and to And what go is into. your personal, it's, it's a good opportunity for Dil, but what is your personal opinion of that, um, given that it, um, you know, strengthening kind of this private network of, of schools and meanwhile the, you know, public investments in education are, are lagging and, uh, you know, Pakistan in terms of its social development indicators is also not doing very well. I mean, what, do, what kind of message does this actually send in your opinion? Well, you know, I, first of all, I'm a bit skeptical. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to say anything right now until mm -hmm. we actually work with them and see how it goes. But from sure. what I've seen of government school teachers, the, the issue is that they are not, they don't teach in their classrooms. Mm -hmm. Even though they are yeah. better educated right. than, the, than the, because they have to have an MA and they have to have a BA uh, right. to be able to teach, right? right. And, um, and, they, um, and they are usually the, the women who have had the most education in a village. But when they come to school, they don't want to teach. Mm -hmm. This is, it, it's just a phenomena that, you know, we've seen uh, across Pakistan. Um, we've also, I, I'm, no, I'm not sure if you've heard about ghost schools, but that's right. another um, mm -hmm. unfortunate dilemma in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of schools that are just there on paper. And the teachers get their, their salaries, but they do not come to school. And we've act, we have adopted a few of these schools mm -hmm. where we've hired our own teachers and you know, gotten the kids into school and, yeah, and they, they become functional. Interesting. Yes, please go ahead. And please, if you could please introduce yourself sure. before you ask your question. Jim, Jim Vandenbos, USAID. Okay. I wondered if, you, uh, if Dill used uh, any of the school vouchers um, like the system 
used in the Punjab, uh, where the private schools receive some of the vouchers from the public school system. They, 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 they get some assistance from the, from the government. And, and, and uh, if they, with, and then a second question is, what is your financial model? I mean, how do you, how do you pay for your programs? <laughs> uh, yes, that's a very good question, thank you. Um, in answer to your first question, no, we've not used vouchers. Um, we, you know, what we've seen is when you provide quality, you, the kids come. And especially more recently, we are having to deny kids uh, access to our schools because we don't have enough, uh, you know, uh, enough seats open. Um, we, but you're, you're coming back to your, uh, to your second question, uh, how is, what is our model? We raise, we do fundraising in the, in the US, in, in the UK, in, uh, as well as Pakistan. Um, in, uh, we are also registered in Hong Kong and Canada. So most of us, our funding is coming from Pakistani expatriates. Um, and then, of course, we get foundation funding as well. Um, and we do, we have received a couple of grants from uh, USAID and from UK aid as well. Okay. Another question? Uh, working here as a fellow. Uh, my question is, okay, for, for the last uh, 25 to 30 years, we are hearing a very success, uh, successful stories of NGOs working in the Pakistan in the field of education. Uh, and they are training a lot of thousands, um, but I think lakhs of teachers have trained so far. And lakhs of, uh, lakhs of uh, children have uh, got uh, education with the help of UNESCO, UNICEF, and other NGOs. So why uh, over the standard of education and uh, education is declining day by day in the Pakistan? What is the reason, do you think? What is your... Um, you know, the NGO sector is very small. In Pakistan, it's not that large. And there are very few organizations that are really doing, uh, there are very few organizations uh, uh, that are providing the quality of education that you, that you need to see changes in the country. Majority, majority of the, uh, the private schools especially, uh, in the low-income private schools is what you're talking about, I guess, the, the ones that are run by, by NGOs. Um, you still see there's rote learning going on. There's really no change in that sense, you know. And until there is there is a complete change in the way education is being imparted, you're not going to find you're not going to find leaders, and you're not going to find uh, you know even people who can you know, uh, take on uh, you know decent jobs because there is if you cannot speak English, if you cannot learn, if you can't read, you know what is your there's no uh, there's no prospect for you in that situation, yeah. Uh, other um, thing is that uh, so I, I would like to add something on the, on the question uh, asked, uh, that uh, um, there is no consistency of the same work of the NGOs sometimes, uh, like uh, some projects are for the short period project, education project, but it needs to be worked more on the on the same type of the project, like uh, we are doing, we are we are working on the same project since last 10 years. So, uh, but we are working in some limited area. So it needs to be uh, work continuously because uh, some in, there are some NGOs which work for some uh, limited period. They can't see the impact exactly. Right. That might be the reason that um, we, and they are, we are not getting such results. I think, Shirin, what I recall earlier on when the, uh, I'm talking about the time when we first started um, our work in Pakistan, the majority of the NGOs were setting up schools that were doing, in, five, in three years, they would do a five-year curriculum. Majority of the schools are one-room, one-teacher schools. And, you know, if yes. you expect a teacher who barely has a, a good, under, um, you know, um, good pedagogical skills herself, asking her to mm. teach five grades, at the same time, I mean, what kind, of, what kind of quality are you going to see in those schools? And that's exactly what's happened. A lot of money has been thrown into, into these schools, and you're seeing no results at all. Uh, you are doing some cooperation with the uh, KPK government. 
have you raised any question uh, about uh, KP Gor KPK government is going to radicalize over curriculum? So you have raised any question against this issue or not? We, uh, <laughs> well, we, uh, we are very much in the very early stages. We haven't really discussed curriculum or anything right now. We are really looking to see how we can have a meaningful, um, you know, kind of a, like, a partnership with them. Uh, so we will, th those, th those topics will be raised because they'll, uh, what we did was, although we follow the government curriculum standards, and by the way, the government curriculum standards are extremely high, they're international, they're almost at the international level. Mm -hmm. um, we actually find them a little too aggressive, even for mm -hmm. our own schools, and we need to we taper them down a little bit to, to kind of suit, the, to make sure that our, our teachers are able to teach at that level. But... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but yet again, I mean, you know, when it comes to the books and when it comes to the teachers, th th you don't see any performance at all. Our uh, curriculum is based on the Hakim Narayan. Do you try to change it? We do not use the, the curriculum textbooks, not the, the curriculum itself. Textbooks. The okay, curriculum okay. standards are totally different, right? Mm -hmm. It is some of the textbooks. We do not use the government textbooks. We use OUP, we, we, we had to scour the market to find the right textbooks. Even the textbooks on the market are not actually meeting the government curriculum demand. They don't, you know, there, there's so many things that are left out. So we found the right book and then we have, we have developed teacher's guides and we use those guides to compensate for what's missing in the books. And I would just like to ask a follow-up question to that is, what is the level of government oversight I guess you could say, uh, in terms of your work, being that these are private schools, um, are they looking at the curriculum and uh, you know analyzing the textbooks or how the teachers are qualified in terms of their education? I mean, is there a heavy amount of oversight or is there? They're, they're, they're totally hands off. Okay. There is absolutely no concern at all. Okay. Um, our, t our students do take the fifth grade and the, and the metric exam. Because in, in the rural areas, obviously, we cannot have them, even the Al Khan, um, right foundation, their curriculum is in English, so you cannot have mm -hmm. our kids take those exams. So sure. we do prepare them. It's sad, but for the fifth and the tenth grade, we, we have to teach them the way the government wants the students taught, because otherwise they will not pass the their course. exams. It's all right. based on road. So a few months before the exams, we, we just get the government books in, and we yeah. just get the students to, to learn and to you know, pass those exams. And how do you enter a community? How do you choose these schools? And, and oftentimes you're invited, of course, but how do you start a Dill school somewhere? You know, in the beginning, when we started our work, uh, we would look at, um, we, we would actually look for good NGOs to work with. Hmm. Because remember, Dill started in the US. Mm -hmm. we, it was really an effort of the Pakistani American community mm -hmm. to give back to a country that had invested in their education. You know, mm -hmm. most of us are my generation. Uh, we, had our, we went to school in Pakistan, and we, it was our choice to leave Pakistan and come to our adopt, you know, adopted mm -hmm. uh, land. Um, but we always had this, this, this sense that, or maybe this nagging feeling that uh, we took away a resource when we left Pakistan because Pakistan, our education in mm -hmm. Pakistan was free. Mm -hmm. and, and what better way to give back than to educate children in Pakistan? And that was really the premise behind Dil, um, Dil's you know, uh, Dil being created. Um, so, um, where was I? <laughs> you took me somewhere else. How you enter into a so, community? Yeah. And so how do we enter into the community? The so it the demand. Um, so the demand from this community was to when we first started, we started in Punjab, the very mm -hmm. first schools that we opened up, and then we looked at our uh, you know at our, our population uh, or our donor population wanted us to kind of spread into the other provinces as mm -hmm. well. So there was a lot of thrust there. But initially what we would do, we, we are also established in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we have a board in Pakistan. We're registered in Pakistan. And we, they are the ones who go in and do due diligence. So we would first look for a good NGO who had at least three, four years of experience in education. Mm -hmm. And we would work with them. So for the first five, six years, we worked with, um, with partners. And then we realized that for us to really get a good understanding, we needed to start opening our own schools as well. Mm -hmm. and, and at that point, you know, we, um, again, we started in Pindi and Islamabad. Those mm -hmm. were the first, uh, first areas where we started our schools. But it, but it was only the first few projects where we actually vetted the organizations and went into, the, into those areas. 
Uh, after that, we've only been expanding. So mm -hmm. where we are at, we continue to kind of you know, uh, expand our footprint within those areas. Okay. And that way, it, 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 you can't just go in and do a one-off school, right? right? Because for, for you to, you need management. So whenever we go into an area, we want a minimum of 10 to 15 schools because we have school officers and we've got you know, project managers that, that have to run, run that, you know, the, those schools. And also teacher training becomes less expensive then mm -hmm. because they, when we train, then we train all the teachers in, in the cluster right. you know, in one go. One more question. In Pakistan, 80% goes to administration costs and 20% goes to education costs. And um, he has, there's, the gentleman has a question back there. Please go ahead. I just wanted, uh, could you say something about parental involvement in DIL schools? Yes, is, there, we, is there any? We have PTAs, and we have very oh, strong PTAs. And very often, they, the P PTAs um, end up doing projects. Uh, so for, for example, if, um, if there is a need for maybe um, you know, a water cooler or something like that, they will actually collect funds. <coughs> Very often, the land has been given for the school has been given by the community, mm -hmm. and it's usually a parent. Um, and also, parents are involved in the sense that you know the teachers get them when they have a parent days for the parents. You know when they come in and they share the reports, the report cards of the students with them. It's just like you know the the. It's very similar to our schools here. I mean, there is there's honestly in in that sense there's not that much of a difference. They they have parent days for the parents. Um, they they they'll do other events at the schools where they invite the parents. So there is a lot of parental involvement now. That's that's why it, it's so important because they must the parents have to understand the you know that that the kids need to be in school every day, and this is the only way. It's the only way to do that is to get them involved. And m many of them are not educated, you know, so you, you even, but even then, they know the difference between a good school and a bad school. You know? Something? We do, yes, we do. And I'll tell you why we do that. It's, we, we charge 100 rupees only for, per child per month. Right, and there is a reason for that. That hundred rupees doesn't do anything for them. It's really being put into an account. So, in, if any, if the school needs something, they'll use it for that. But this started very early on because we felt that if the parents even give a little bit, contribute a little bit towards the child's uh, education, they will make sure that the child comes to school. Mm -hmm. A free education, they believe, is doesn't have value. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, it's you know, it's nothing more than that. But yeah, we do charge a very small fee. And could you, you, you mentioned um, foreign donors a little bit. Um, I know that this sector is one in which foreign donors are heavily engaged in, the uh, United States and United Kingdom and a few others. Um, and I think that's a good thing. But could you comment a little bit on how uh, foreign donors can be most effective in working on education in Pakistan, uh, given all of your work? You know, um, yes, I think it is very important that foreign donors um, monitor how their funds are being used. Because mm -hmm. very often what happens is that they, it, the funding is given and the, there's so much corruption in the, in, you know, in the mm -hmm. public school system itself mm -hmm. that a lot of the money is just siphoned off. Mm -hmm. and, if, um, and I know that the situation right now on the ground is such that very often they're not able to go and visit. Mm -hmm. But you know, I've, I've been saying this for a while, but the American Pakistani diaspora can do a lot of that work for, for you, mm -hmm. you know, for, for, for the foreign um, uh, uh, funding organizations as well. Mm -hmm. uh, engage them, but, but, but make sure that you see where the money is being used. Any other questions? No? All right. Well, Shireen, is there any uh, Shireen, is the there final any comments you'd like to make? Um, Shirin, can you maybe just talk about the impact of mobile learning yes. on your teachers? Because I know that that was something you had wanted to say uh, to talk about. Yes, uh, actually, mobile learning project. I uh, myself is pretty much satisfied from that uh, project. Uh, though I had a lot of fear when first we started, initiated the project and first when I was told that such type of project is uh, coming uh, in their uh, village launching such project. 
So I frightened to some extent that how this project will run uh, and uh, what will be happen if we did not succeed. Uh, there was also a fear that if uh, um, mishandled, the device is mishandled and teachers couldn't understand what is being taught in that. So, uh, um, but once we initiated, the, and the same fear was also in the mind of the teachers. They were thinking that uh, this might create trouble for them. This might, uh, they might be uh, engaged more and every time they had to submit the assignments through uh, phones. But uh, once it is launched and we seen a very, very good impact and uh, enthusiasm of the teachers increased and there, there was a lot of change in the teacher's behavior. Uh, teachers were very interested to see the videos. They were downloading uh, the videos in their cell phones and they were taking um, those devices at their homes and they were looking when there was uh, um, um, electricity bro breakdown usually in, in our area. Yes, it's, it is very huge problem. It is a very big problem. So they were at that time they were uh, looking these videos. So in this way they were uh, means they were become more um, learned through this. They were also um, making their lesson plans, looking the activities. The activities also uh, um, um, supported them how to make the activities, and they made lesson plans and uh, uh, they became able to deliver the classes uh, accordingly. So I must say that um, these devices supported a lot to the teachers, especially also the new teachers even. Um, when the, uh, usually when teachers come, we give them orientation, how you have to teach and some basic information regarding the teaching in the school. But um, some teachers don't have much knowledge on the content. So it makes trouble sometimes, but these devices made this easy. They, when they first come uh, to uh, um, become as a teacher, we give them these devices and they see the videos. Uh, they increase their content knowledge and uh, and they were um, well aware how to uh, teach the class. So, um, and through these phones, I seen a lot of change in the teacher's personality even. They become change their confidence level uh, um, quickly. Uh, um, it um, they build their confidence level. First few few teachers I saw they were really confused while they were and they speaking, but after some time I saw them they were very vocal. They there wasn't any uh, shy among them. Right. So. Yeah, Shirin, I think it, I just want to kind of reinforce that because what sh what Shirin has reported, and this is especially uh, uh, with uh, with the mobile phone program, she said that you know technology is amazing. It really is amazing. Mm -hmm. What she saw was a, a change in or a, an increase in the teacher's confidence level because suddenly this teacher had the you know she was uh, she she was able to view these videos and to improve her own capacity to teach and when that when she took that into the classroom the kind of response that she started seeing from the students actually helped build her own confidence and i mean uh, that was one thing we were not looking you know we, we weren't expecting that kind of a change to happen but uh, and the other thing i wanted to mention was that in uh, about 50% um, of schools we have computer labs and the kind of um, improvement that those have brought about is also quite mind-boggling. Um, the teachers are doing research, students are doing research. Very often the students are taken into the computer lab to show them certain concepts, you know, especially science um, concepts that, that they need more clarity on. Um, so, and we've also, because of that, I think the reputation of the school has, you know, kind of, it, it spreads, the word spreads into the neighboring areas as well. Um, and uh, and in some of these schools in the afternoons, um, after school, we have programs where neighborhood kids can come and start working on the computers and learning uh, computer, um, uh, you know, how to operate computers and so on as well. So the, and uh, our libraries as well, we have libraries in all our schools, and those are also open to the community. So we are seeing after school kids coming in, checking out books and, you know, and also learning to read, um, where majority of those kids have never even owned a book. 
Um, so, you know, the, the effects of the school are far-reaching, far and they, you know, go way beyond just the, the kids that, that are studying in the school. And uh, Shireen, that, that's something you are seeing in a lot of your schools as well, right? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, first I would like to add something on the M learning that the devices not on uh, our teachers not only benefited from these devices, oh, yes. Yes. but there uh, in some instances we saw the uh, change and they told us the teachers told us that they and their sisters who are teaching somewhere elsewhere means in some other schools, so they also took benefit from these videos they were, uh, they were seen with their sisters and in in one case one teacher told me that he, uh, that her father is uh, is a teacher in a government school so he was first he uh, prohibited her daughter don't take this device because he was uh, to, uh, a reluctant person and he was uh, telling her daughter that you don't have to take any mobile in uh, means uh, so he pro prohibited her, but later we motivated that teacher that you take and this will benefit you. And after taking that device, uh, a very good result and very good be behavior change we saw in her family, that his father, who was also a government teacher, he, he told her daughter, okay, give me your device, I want to see these videos. And he saw those videos and he implemented the same things in, in his oh, wow. school. So that was a good story um, I, I, I like to mention here. You must so, share that story with us, Shireen, in the next quarterly report. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so yeah, sure. these are, you know, these are things that we have not documented yet. But can you imagine, I mean, these, these videos are now being seen by other teachers and even government school teachers who are, you know, using them to improve uh, education. Yes, please go ahead. Um, so I, I have a question. Um, thank you. So, you know, you've talked a little bit about the, the teacher training and the development of the schools and the, and the you know, uh, curriculum development, and that is all having a positive impact. What do you see um, going forward uh, for DIL and broadly speaking for education for girls and women in Pakistan over the next five, ten years and onwards? What is kind of your vision and the organization's vision for that? Well, first of all, we have only focused on the primary curriculum so far. So we, we have to now, uh, starting this year, we are now looking at the middle school curriculum. So we're going from sixth to seventh to the eighth grade. What we've learned through our training, um, especially the mobile, uh, the, the uh, mobile learning um, program is that uh, the students have also been very interested in looking at the videos themselves. So in some cases, the teachers have actually taken the, they were not supposed to, but they just ended up doing it themselves. They started taking them into the classroom and showing them to the students because these videos were really made only for the teachers, right? And they are seeing very positive results. Mm -hmm. Because remember that, you know, it takes us years to train our teachers. We, we do also, um, we lose teachers at about 12% per year. So new teachers are coming in constantly as well. But when you have a video done by a guru teacher who really knows how to teach, the impact is very different. And what we are now thinking is, um, and we are hoping to get funding um, for this, but we want to, for the 6th and the 7th and the 8th grade, we want to start taking these videos into the classrooms. So at least when the child first learns a concept, they are learning it the way it should be taught. Mm. Right, because sixth graders don't need that, the kind of socializing that the younger kids need, because you can't do this for the younger kids. They really, the teachers have to, I mean, they socially they need to interact. There's a lot more that needs to happen at that grade level. But when you're looking at the higher grade levels, it's a different way to learn. So our, our next focus for the next two, three years is exactly that. We want to now start working on, on the curriculum for the, you know, for the higher grades and then take it up to metric. Um, so that we can, the results that we're seeing in our primary school, we continue to see them. And there's huge demand. I mean, if you, if Shireen will, uh, I don't know if, you, <laughs> if she wants to say something here, but the, from our schools, there's this huge demand that, you know, don't stop at the primary. We need, you know, we need more. It, it's taken us a while. It's not that easy because we've been building our curriculum up. So we did the first grade, then we did the second grade. So every year we add on a grade. So now we're at the sixth grade. It's going to take us a few years to get up to metric. Mm -hmm. But we, again, and, and the plan is to take it beyond those schools and take it beyond those schools through our training college. And that's where our future focus is. I'm really not a big proponent of uh, making buildings. 
Um, I think even a simple you know, structure is fine. It is really what is inside the walls of the school that is important. And, the, you know, and that's where we want to keep our focus. Um, and we feel that training is, is a way that we can really utilize our funds to the max. Every teacher you train is going to affect 25 to 50 kids every year, year on year. Right? So when we open a school, it costs, even building a school right now in Pakistan, it costs you approximately $100,000. If we take that money and we put it into teacher training, the results are much, much larger. And you, you, know, you touch so many more kids that way. So our team college is where our focus is going to be. And we are hoping to um, start offering. And we're going to be offering short courses, not, not the two-year BA or you know, the two-year BA and the two-year M, the four-year MED course. We want to really, really focus on the rural teachers' needs. And those are vastly different from the um, you know, from the urban teachers' um, needs. Are there uh, geographic areas that you haven't been able to get into that you would like to access over the next five to ten years? We have. We were in Balochistan for a few years, mm -hmm. um, and at that time, um, it was only um, we, we only did um, high schools. Mm -hmm. um, the government actually took over that uh, that mm -hmm. project, and we were um, because we were not directly engaged in terms of we were funding that project more so than being directly engaged in it. But we did make sure that you know we uh, we provided good quality teaching, um, the training, and so on. Uh, we funded all that, and it actually ended up being a very successful program. And um, from what I've heard, UNICEF has adopted that as as mm -hmm. um, you know as, as some um, they kind of using that same format as we did. Um, so what uh, it, it's about having a cluster of uh, primary schools, and then you have a high school mm -hmm. for girls only, because again, it's a very, very conservative area. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, and, and so, um, it's so you would like to get back into Balochistan? We maybe, want to or? get back into Balochistan, but at the primary level, because okay. that's where our strength is. And then we'll take it up to middle school. So we really want to take on a cluster of primary schools. And we've been discussing that as well. I think probably 2015 is when we're going to go back into Balochistan. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. There's a question back there. On that a little bit. Will you need government assistance to push back into Balochistan? Would it just be a, a, um, a solitary move? You know, would you need security and things like that to, to reinforce what you're you doing? You know, we, uh, we generally keep a very low profile. Even in the, where, uh, when I, um, earlier I spoke about one of our schools being burnt down, even there, we do not, we do not construct you know, large build school buildings. We just stay under the radar always. So usually our schools mm -hmm. are in, you know, in, in more, they look more like homes. Um, and that's, in Balochistan again, I think we're going to enter just that way. I don't think we're going to go in with a bang and, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's just staying under the radar and just doing our work um, because we, we will keep focusing on girls' education. Pakistan, there is a main emphasis on memorization. So, do you have, uh, do you introduced, uh, uh, have you introduced any critical thinking? Absolutely. Uh, in the your system, teaching system. Absolutely, our our system is totally activity based. Right, there is our teachers. It, it took us a while. It took us about a year or so to break that habit. It was teachers couldn't understand what we meant when we said you cannot teach by rote. I mean, that's what they, that's how they learned. But when they started uh, using the, the, we use the latest teaching techniques that are used here, uh, you know, in the U.S. Uh, and in, in the West. And uh, when they started using those techniques and they started seeing the results and they started seeing how kids were learning much faster, um, that's when they, uh, you know, they, they started adopting uh, and really kind of believing in them. So yes, we, we broke that. I mean, I, it, it was such a pleasure when we first saw that our teachers were actually using techniques and activity-based learning, yeah. Yes, sir. And please introduce yourself, too. Uh, my name is Shirin um, So, I mean, I've spent a decent amount of time in Egypt, and there's a lot of parallels between Egypt and Pakistan, uh, especially this dichotomy between sort of a modern identity and an Islamic identity that's kind of like clashing uh, that, we, that we see uh, all around the Muslim world. And, um, and while you were talking, it kind of, you know, occurred to me that um, you know, perhaps in order to, to try to reach some sort of uh, middle ground between these two identities, is, I guess his comment is more of like a suggestion, but um, I mean, do you think it would be effective to potentially 
um, you know, maybe incorporate some sort of uh, spiritual values, religious learning in a sense that is like a an antithesis to the extremist rhetoric, you know, that incorporates religion but in a form of, uh, of like social good, public service and love and like the things that, you know, religion uh, at its core, uh, you know, really speaks to. Uh, right. just we, uh, we don't touch religion as such, you know, because um, right now it's such a controversial topic in Pakistan that, you know, we just focus on subjects, <laughs> subject knowledge and learning. But we do, our, our kids are doing a lot of project, uh, projects outside um, of their school. So they, they're doing community projects, we're keeping them involved there. Um, and I think those things are very important, you know, for them to understand the value of civics itself, how they need to be a part of improving their own communities. Um, you know, so, some of them have done projects like uh, cleaning the streets and, you know, and I mean, so that's where our focus is. And we do, th through social studies, through other subjects, you know, we're trying to bring this in. Islamiyat is just taught as a subject um, in mm -hmm. our schools, just the way we learned it when we were growing up. Mm -hmm. But, you know, nothing beyond that. Totally, yes, and, and that's a, we heavily um, focus on, on critical thinking skills, yeah. problem solving, reasoning. We really encourage our children to ask questions, um, you know, and, and to, to, to reason with us. There are a lot of open-ended questions by teachers. I mean, those are some things that we are watching constantly. So ju just a s more specific question on the curriculum. So who actually develops the curriculum for your schools? Is it the teachers in the school, or do you have a, a board that kind of looks at all of the schools so writ large and what should be taught? So, so we, as I said, we follow the government's 2006 national standards, okay. right? And then based on that, okay. we, uh, we have a curriculum development department. Okay. Our English um, curriculum developer actually sits in the, uh, she's in the US. Okay. And, um, and she also does the English and the math. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the Urdu and science and social studies is being done in Pakistan. Okay. Okay. So yes, we do. So we do take the standards and then we, you know, fill, sure. fill the gap after. <laughs> right. One more question there. Go ahead. Yeah, last one. It's a simple question, but um, obviously the UN and in particular UNICEF have a mandate to work with the government on developing the education sector. And you've got something that's much more than just building schools. You're, you've got a model that works for capacity building and teaching teachers, especially in rural contexts. Is there uptake in terms of working with you on quite a scaled up level in terms of using your model or working Absolutely. through you as a subgrant? Absolutely. I mean, we have not only um, are we strong in, you know, with our curriculum and our training, we have a very strong reading program as well. Our kids have learned um, through phonics to read. Um, and they, when we compare them to the ASR, the, you know, to the test that, that's nationally, um, it, it's probably the most uh, highly uh, accepted test nationally, our kids performed extremely well. And we are very open to that. We want our model to be, uh, you know, s scaled through Pakistan because I we know it's worked. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you, Fiza and Shireen. Thank you very much for taking time out of your evening. Um, this was a wonderful discussion, and I learned a lot. Uh, I'm sure everyone else did too. Thank, thank you. you. Yep. Thank and you. I also want to thank the America, the New America Foundation, for <laughs> giving us this opportunity. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you.